Okay, holy shit, there is so much that could be said about Beyond Two Souls, it is literally maddening. This is like my third attempt at a script, which is not a normal thing for me. Should it be normal? Probably, but I've never been so unsure how to tackle anything before this. There's just so much, and I wanted to make sure to address everything, to make a definitive video on the subject. Make a video that people will always associate with it. That's pretty ambitious for someone whose audience only recently surpassed the entire workforce of my public library, and not by much. But I know my influences, and I want to at least match what they can do. The problem is how messy Beyond Two Souls is. With the very nature of its shitty construction, it defies cohesion. All of its problems feed into each other, so to write about even one thing is to segue into different problems, and any semblance of structure melts into a stream of consciousness or a barose. So I'm going to embrace that here. I'll be reasonable and not talk about everything. I've limited my scope and I'm just sticking to the talking points that I'm confident on. But I'm just going for it. Structure be damned. Because done is better than perfect. That's what Satch said, and I like that guy. Anyway, enough comforting myself publicly. Let's introduce this thing. It's slam zone time. Beyond Two Souls is a 2013 Sony exclusive title by French developer Quantic Dream, written and directed by infamous designer slash writer David Cage. It stars Ellen Page as Jody, a girl born connected to an entity spirit ghost phantom named Aiden. The government uses Jody and Aiden in experiments to understand the supernatural, and sends them into the CIA to use their abilities to do some tactical espionage action. <laughs> Jody dips when she realizes she doesn't want to be a dog of the military. Where the government promptly chases her down for a while, she's worn down and depressed, and then they catch her and she's like, fine, I'll help stop the Kazakhstanian government from utilizing entities for their military. They succeed, but then Willem Dafoe says, fuck death, <laughs> and he tries to remove the barriers between the normal world and the infra world, and Jody's got to stop him. That's the gist of it. So you may have noticed I've deliberately avoided labeling Beyond Two Souls as a game. Or maybe you didn't, and this is just my lame excuse for a transition, whatever. Do I not think it's a game? I don't know. If you watch my video titled Fuck Video Games, which you must have because nobody could resist such spicy hot clickbait, then you'll know that on some level, that question isn't something I worry too much about. By the way, I'm gonna use the word game for it from here on out, just cause it's easier, so if you have a problem with that, meet me at my address. 90 with that being said, to trudge through beyond begs another question. Did this need to be interactive in any way? And, uh, no, probably not. Okay, okay, something we should get out of the way is that interactivity doesn't need to be, like, fun or intricate or make you get good. Controversially, David Cage said that fail states are a failure of design, which is stupid hyperbolic, but for the experiences he wants to make, there is some sense to it. This ain't Super Meat Boy, it ain't Dark Souls. They have different expectations of their audiences. Ideally, Beyond wants to use interactivity to tell a story, and not force anyone into some test of skill. And there are many experiences that do that really well, like, say, the Stanley Parable, which is solely composed of moving around and pressing buttons in order to create a quirky deconstruction of the interactive medium in general. Setting up a player with the expectations of the power of their volition only to dash them would not work without interactivity. Gone Home 2 is mostly walking around, but you also explore a house, pick shit up, and examine those artifacts left from the family to piece together what has happened to them. Not only are the specific details you find important, but the way in which you uncover them is meaningful. People are not just trapped in their bodies or their thoughts, they extend to the things they own, the things they create, and you are tasked with understanding that by moving through and interacting with the world in your own way. Interactivity is integral. So what does Beyond Two Souls do with it? Well, we've got an experience composed completely by quick-time events, or else hyper-contextual interactions, with a super low skill ceiling to help facilitate almost anyone in getting through the experience without any fail states. In other words, FUCKING GRANDMA CAN PLAY! One of Beyond's major problems is how it frames its mechanics. In the playing fields, aka Jared's, aka my boys, video, what is level design and intro, 
He defines mechanics as actions that the player can do, things directly tied to the inputs of the game. This is generally static throughout a whole experience, or else there might be some main mechanics and some alternative ones. Like, Bioshock's got shooting, but it's also got separate mechanics for its hacking, which has you moving little pipes around on a board. Or how about Bloodborne, whose mechanics stay the same throughout? To light attack, you hit R1, always. Or even the Stanley Parable, which has movement and all-purpose interact button. These mechanics, and the relationship they have with the systems, define an experience's ludonarrative, or the story told specifically by the gameplay. Bloodborne's got mechanics which let you attack things, and you've got the Rally and Blood Echo systems which interact with those mechanics to help tell the story of a bloodthirsty hunter. Stanley Parable gives you movement mechanics to, you know, move about a space, which triggers the narration and scripting systems to give a crude sense of choice which it looks to critique. Though a game is designed in such a way to promote certain playstyles, it is up to the player to decide how to use these tools given to them. So in the end, the Ludo narrative is a work of collaborative discovery between the designer and player. This is probably a subset of the concept called the Magic Circle, which Chariot Rider made a video on. Go watch that to learn more about the implicit player-designer relationship in games. Now the problem with Beyond Two Souls, with its QTEs, is that the player is alienated from the mechanics. You're not given tools in order to figure out the Ludo narrative for yourself. Instead, you are railroaded into doing exactly what it is that the designers wanted you to do. So moving the right analog stick can open a door, let you take a seat, punch some asshole, or quickly moving your controller down will strum a guitar or light a match. Your imports are so universalized and contextual that there is no collaboration with some sort of toolset, but instead the unveiled direction of the designers to do the button sequence they had planned for you. The designers keep the magic circle to themselves, not letting the player have any sway over its composition. They just say, here's your checklist for the story to continue, please do it in a timely fashion. Or not, they don't care. Seriously, even if you fuck up or just don't do anything, whatever you're supposed to do will happen regardless. When you're a secret agent in Somalia, Aiden will just murk people for you if you just mess up a fight. Okay, this isn't always the case, like in the condenser section. Aiden is protecting Jody from dark entities, and if you just do fuck all, she gets hurt and runs away. Which leads to a cutscene that is only marginally different from the one that would have played had you turned off the condenser. Also, turning it off or not is meaningless to the plot. It never comes up again. Yet, this is a common through line and beyond. Most decisions are narratively meaningless or else cosmetic. And if we remember the game professor's lesson in his video, meaningful choices don't need to change the story, well, meaningful choices don't need to change the story. Wait a second. Was that? Is that what I think? Oh, what the fuck, Sam? Get that out of there. Come on. You know better. You should know better. If we look at Telltale's The Walking Dead, that's another experience with minimal player developer collaboration, and a story that is always going to the same place no matter what. The interesting part is its sort of trolley problem design, which asks you to make heavy moral decisions, and the characters will internalize what you've done, affecting how they interact with you in the future. The limited interactivity and choices, at the very least, add to the curated metagame conversation surrounding what everyone picked and why. Beyond Two Souls doesn't even get over that sort of hurdle. Your relationships with characters will not be altered with any significance based on the limited choices you're given. Shit, there's this guy Ryan in the game, and he's supposed to be your love interest, but you can constantly reject him, which, why wouldn't I? I don't see the relationship grow, and he's also complicit in convincing Jody to take out the democratically elected president of Somalia for seemingly no good reason, so I ain't having none of it. But of course, in the final chapter, when you are in a demon-infested sandstorm, no matter what, you will kiss this guy regardless of the options you chose before. So fucking stupid. The point is, when you shift an experience's focus from its interactivity, you at least need to make what little there is have some impact. Shit, say what you will about Detroit Become Human, stuff you did affected how characters interact with each other. Fuck, you can get one of the main playable characters killed within their first chapter if you feel like it. Now those who know a bit more about Beyond Two Souls may be saying to themselves, Hey, there are a bunch of choices you can make that, yeah, don't affect the outcome of the whole story, but aren't they equally valid moral choices like in The Walking Dead? What about the people that you can save or let die in the story, Zack? What about the torture scene, Zack? What about the part where you can have Jody hurt... her... self? Oh, we'll get to that shit. Just to get the torture section out of the way, what's happening is this boy wants you to reveal your identity to the Kazarstanian government. Why did they go with Kazarstan? 
Did David just forget what Kazakhstan was called and went with his best guess? And if Kazakhstan is supposed to be one of the stands, uh, how come this dude's name is Wang Jiang? This ethnic ambiguity bugs me, especially since they subtly name drop Somalia during the argument between Jody and Ryan on the plane. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. And if you don't tell him who you are, Ryan loses an eye. That's it. That is the only meaningful outcome of that decision. The US government doesn't reprimand you, the Kazakhstanian government doesn't gain or lose anything because of it. And I know it's reductive to say that consequences are all that define what is moral, though I'm mostly a consequentialist, but it's something that never comes up again. He just looks a bit more like Big Boss, which is honestly an upgrade in my opinion. I'm going to make a bold statement here, but I believe that if a story presents a decision for the audience and a character, what makes that decision meaningful is how the characters change and react to it. We don't see that here, it's just a cheap way of raising stakes for a second without needing to deliver on the promise of its possible ramifications. This absent-mindedness to the weight of decisions and beyond is exemplified by the characters that you can let live or die. Here's a lineup of the major characters that you have control over dying which are trophy worthy. Though the trophies for keeping everyone alive slash letting everyone die doesn't include him, I felt it would be rude not to include this nameless guard that you can possess his eye and have him jump from a balcony. All this does is compromise whatever mission you're on at this embassy, but it doesn't affect anything else in the game. It's never mentioned again. You don't even get to know why you're there, it's all contextless. Anyway, these two, Walter and Jimmy, are part of the homeless crew that Jody finds herself in after she defects from the CIA. Due to some masochists specifically targeting the homeless who want revenge on Jody after she beats him up, everyone gets trapped in a burning building and it's up to Jody to help them out to safety. But you can just let Walter and Jimmy die in the fire. It's not like there's any reason not to save them, it doesn't take much effort on the player's part and leaving them is no positive benefit. The only reason I could see someone doing so their first time through is either because they didn't realize where Walter was, he's, he's behind this door, and even though the camera does look over that way, maybe someone wasn't paying attention? Or they didn't want a chance to jump with Jimmy, and didn't think he'd make it anyway. Yet if you leave them to a pain that I have no way of even imagining, no one really cares. The other two in the group just accept you with arms wide open, no questions asked. None. Not even a, it's a damn shame they died, huh? Never acknowledged again. Moving on to Paul. Okay, actually, I need to go on a tangent right now and talk a bit about this section of the game, Navajo. On top of being super dull with like zero character work for anyone in this section, which is especially bad considering they want this hunk to be a possible love interest, we have one fucking conversation with them, and it amounts to Jody giving vague platitudes about her finding herself. This section is some white saver bullshit to boot. Turns out, some Navajo men in the past opened a portal to the infraworld in order to get revenge on the white man, but a spirit they call Yeitso just straight wrecks all their shit. And as Grandma Shimasani says, They know they were wrong, so they returned to protect us from the evil that they released. Hence why we see those spirit guys protecting the house at night. So not only is this section a story of how Native Americans have to learn the lesson that Revenge isn't nice, guys. But it's up to this random fucking white girl to just swoop in one day and get rid of this presence that's persisted for presumably a century. And when the ritual to send Yitzo back is done, they invite her to a burial ground where no white man has gone before. She's that damn special to these folks. I don't know, it's just super frustrating to see this tropey bullshit of dumb and racist. To go back to what I was talking about, though, this man, Paul, is another character that you can let live or die. He gets wounded by Yitzo, and while Jody's preparing the ritual to send it back to the infraworld, you have the option to go heal Paul. Personally, I didn't the first time I played through, because they sequester him in this random room in the house you've never been to, and there's a lot going on, and my first priority is to prepare against the impending doom, rather than to think to myself, Oh, yeah, there's that healing ability I've used like twice and is super contextual, so I don't think of it as a tool in my arsenal and more as the next piece of choreography I'm supposed to do in the sequence. I'll go do that for Paul right now. Well, if he dies, nothing really happens. The brothers are a bit bummed out about it, but Jay reassures Jody that he's happy where he is. So it's fine. Like with Walter and Jimmy, there isn't a good narrative reason to not save Paul. Simply meta ones, like forgetting that you could or wanting to get an achievement. Moving on to Nora, Jody's mother. Okay, so Nora and her husband were both gifted with supernatural powers, not sure what that really means, and the government was like, whoa, shit, if they get together, they're gonna give birth to, like, Danny Phantom or some shit, so they wanted in on that baby. 
After Nora gives birth to Jody, they put her in an unrecoverable coma and take her baby girl from her. Oh, also Aiden is Jody's brother who died during the birth. And he became a ghost attached to her. So, yeah. Fast forward to Jody as an adult, and she goes to find her mother to get closure. She's able to speak to her mother's spirit. They have an emotional moment. And as you leave the hospital room, you can choose to take her off life support or not. So on the surface, this is definitely a moral conundrum. Is life worth preserving even when the person isn't capable of directly interacting with those around them? Do they still retain their full personhood or part of it? Once we see the conclusion of beyond, however, this moment is complicated. Uh, I'll put a pin in this, I guess. All right, the last two deaths are Cole and Ryan. Cole gets injured running to the condenser in the end. You can either save him or leave him. I guess you might think he can't be saved, but it's really easy to get him, so why not try, right? Now, Ryan has very specific parameters to die. If you fail to pacify Nathan, and don't kill him as Aiden, Ryan jumps in front of him and takes a bullet for you. So in first time through, this isn't really much of a choice. Ryan is acting of his own volition to save you if you refuse to take Nathan's life, who, by the way, is going to die regardless, hence why I don't include him in this list. I don't know how I should really classify Ryan's death, because diegetically it's not a choice to kill him, but if you have the meta-knowledge of how the game works, it's sort of a choice. When considered as a choice, its true impact is just if you want Ryan to be a martyr in the story. Which aesthetic do you prefer from Ryan? Big boss that sacrifices himself? Big boss that you bang on a beach? Or big boss that you reject because he just reminds you of bad shit? Of memories you wish not to be unlocked? Of times where the struggle may reverberate into the present and is too much to bear even now. So letting these people die has no bearing on the plot or character growth, or for the most part, the moral complexity of the story. However, one tiny silver PlayStation trophy recontextualizes all of these deaths and retroactively threads a very troubling thematic throughline of the story. This trophy is unlocked when you complete Beyond, having all those previously mentioned people die by the end. Its name? A Better World. Nathan Dawkins, played by Willem Dafoe, is a paranormal scientist who, after his wife and daughter tragically passed in a collision with a drunk driver, becomes a sort of surrogate father for Jody when she's growing up in the lab. After Jody is sent off to the CIA, the two don't reunite until Nathan has become a director of the DPA, Department of Paranormal Activities. At this point, the grief of losing his family has had him researching ways that he can communicate with them in the infraworld. Turns out, his attempt to keep them in place is hurting them. He initially denies this fact, only to come up with a more permanent solution. He wants to combine the infraworld and the corporeal world for good. Jody goes into this sandstorm-looking place, the condenser called Black Sun, to stop what he's done. Jody finds Nathan searching for his wife and daughter, and he pulls a gun on her in frustration. If Jody pacifies him by invoking what it is that his family would want, he stops, puts the gun to his head, and takes his own life. Immediately, we see he and his family as souls reunite in an embrace, and they dissolve into luminescent ethereal dust. What the fuck? A man dies by suicide, and in doing so is immediately rewarded with eternal happiness with his family. This is incredibly irresponsible, right? I will admit that the inverse, a person killing themselves resulting in immediate eternal punishment, isn't exactly a great statement either. Suicide is a complex issue. And it's especially complex because we can't be certain what happens when we die. To purport the answer is to reduce the question to a binary rational decision. You cannot do that. Plus, there's problems of autonomy, mental illness, existential justifications, there's a lot. But Beyond Two Souls' narrative reduces it to a single moment of grief, followed by a cathartic emotional release. Inadvertently, Beyond becomes pro-suicide and pro-death. The reason why you can just let those characters die before is because they will go to a better world. Fuck, just listen to Jody describe what the infraworld is like for a human soul. A whole universe of forests and lakes and mountains and rivers. It's all around us. Neither heaven nor hell. There's no god or devil. Just a place where we continue to exist after we die. My soul explores it endlessly and I've still only seen a fragment of it. I can be everywhere and nowhere. I can dissolve into nothing or become whole again. I can merge my soul with others or, or be more alone than any human being has ever been. All this is possible 
merely by the force of my will. Why wouldn't you want to be there? To pick life isn't a choice of some moral weight, it's literally just a matter of if you prefer to stay in the waiting room before becoming an omnipresent cosmic being. Or for Jody's mom. It's basically just straight up better to kill her, which completely disregards the logic subject matter of doctor-assisted suicide. This metaphysical afterlife exists, where seemingly everyone goes no matter what. Though all the police, Somalians, and Kazakhstanians you kill throughout the game don't show up for some reason. And you get the chance to help these people get there quicker, even someone who is trapped in a hell prison. That's what the main form of choice offers in Beyond Two Souls, getting to determine for others whether or not they should stay in the normal world or not. A lot of responsibility is given without actually addressing it as a big deal in the narrative. Jody's decisions are just assumed to be in good faith, and no repercussions are faced because of any of them. She is the arbiter of life and death, whose judgments are as weightless as a quick time event. Now to segue to those other choices that are indicative of something larger and more nefarious about the story. So the self-destruction doesn't stop at Nathan. The player as Jody is presented with the choice to attempt to both cut yourself and or take your life by falling a couple stories into traffic. Now it turns out if you do decide to do these things, Aiden will stop her. But even with that being the case, why the fuck is this an option for the player? The first time I noticed that this was even a thing, I was immediately taken aback and then out of the experience. Why would a player choose to do this? Normally, I'm identifying with the player character, acting as if I am them. Hence why we talk about games in the first person. But here, I couldn't help but see a divide. If Jody is me, then there would never be any reason to hurt myself. First, my perspective of the situation allows me the distance to realize that there's no need to cope with the situation with self-harm. I'm not in the mindset which would make it a viable thing to do. Second. Hurting myself is antithetical to how I understand the interactive medium I've grown up in. I always try to preserve health, save a life. So it becomes this bandersnatch situation where I feel distance from this character, but my will still has power over her. In this context, why would I have her hurt herself? For some sadistic curiosity? And this is what the whole story feels like, some grief porn where you watch and participate in this character just getting shit on all of her life. Of the total 24 chapters, 16 feature Jody going through some form of torment. On some level, this isn't a bad thing. In part, Beyond is thematically about this character being denied agency her entire life. Her birth represents the taking of autonomy. She's stolen from her mother to essentially be the property of the government, so the rest of her life reflects that. She lives in a lab under strict supervision, gets passed to the CIA to be their soldier, wherein they manipulate her into doing some imperialist bullshit, and then chase her when she decides to defect. Even Aiden doesn't allow her full freedom, or else does his best to keep her from doing what she wants. Jody's story is about regaining her autonomy in a world that seeks to take it, or simply hurts her. But the specific ways she is hurt are mostly cruel, and the game doesn't end with a good enough catharsis for her character to justify what she went through. She's tormented by fellow teens, evil spirits, her surrogate father, her brother's spirit, so the player at some points, some piece of shit at this bar, angry Somalians, the police, just a lot of people. She deals with thoughts of suicide and self-harm, and given the right circumstances, can have PTSD to her sexual assault. The story doesn't meaningfully deal with these elements, though. It just raises the emotional stakes when it needs to. And the conclusion of the story is that you stop this massive world-shattering problem that's only introduced in the final third of the game, and then get the choice to either become a spirit, or spend your life with some of the most thinly drawn characters in all of gaming. Jodi repeats throughout the game that she wants to find herself. But who is she at the end of all this? The majority of the time we spend with her, she's getting hurt, running, or fighting. We don't see her meaningfully connect with anyone. That's out of our purview. Jody is not a character unto herself. She's just a recognizable object for the player to do with as they see fit, and play with in such a way to conjure the emotional response desired for oneself. You get this choice, Jody cutting herself, because the audience wants to feel sad. It's grief porn. It's masturbatory. Not expect nothing less from Cage. Hey, looks like I found a reason that justifies the interactivity in Beyond Two Souls. It's just in a way that makes it completely irredeemable. And that's the best word I have for the whole game, irredeemable. It's boring, it's superficially interactive, it's racist, it's careless in its depictions of mental health, and inadvertently suggests that death in any fashion is a viable and worthwhile option over living. If we want games to be emotional and conjure empathy within us, this ain't it, Chief. Beyond is, at best, pandering and pretentious, and at worst, dangerously naive. 
The fact that Quantic Dream and Cage were venerated at all after the release of this is baffling to me, and I think a larger reevaluation of Beyond, alongside our recent critiques of Detroit Become Human, will hopefully make people realize they need to expect more from these people. Or not, and they'll just get to continue to pump out bullshit every five or so years. <laughs> We're gonna make their blood fill the streets. We're gonna paint the houses crimson and watch it turn brown. <laughs>